NHL draft just around the corner now, July 23rd and 24th. We will have rounds two through seven right here on the NHL Network. And here is a look at the top prospects as ranked by Redline Report. They've been doing this a while, do a great job, and you can see a little bit interesting. They have Dylan Gunther as the top spot, number one, Owen Power at number two, and you can see the list move down from there. To talk about that and uh, everything going on with the upcoming draft, let's welcome in the owner and chief scout of Redline Report, Kyle Woodleaf. And Kyle, let's start right at the top. Owen Power has been the guy most people have talked about as the consensus number one. You don't have him there. You have Dylan Gunther there. Why the change? Uh, two reasons, really. Um, for one, the toughest thing to do in the NHL right now is score goals. And if you have a guy like Dylan Gunther who puts the puck in the net on a really regular basis, that's a very valuable commodity in today's NHL. And the second reason is, you know, I look back over the last 15 years in terms of the gold standard of defensemen. And we had, uh, you know, Victor Hedman ranked number one overall in 2009. We had Drew Doughty ranked number two overall in 2008. Those are the two best draft prospects on the defensive side of the last 15 years. And I don't put Owen Power in that category. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's been proven historically over the last decade or more that you can actually get top-notch defensemen in this league drafting later in the first round or even into the second round. But if you look at most of the top forwards, the really, really top forwards in the league, they got to come at the very top end of the draft. All right. Well, listen, we will see. I always love these kind of things because we'll we'll see how it plays out on the 23rd of July and for years to come. And you know that because you've been involved with this for so long. Now, let me ask you, every year a draft class has a strength at a certain position. What would you say is the deepest position in the draft this year? I would have to pick uh, center uh, just because of the fact that, you know, you've got some top end defensemen, but the, the draft falls off on the, on the defensive side after the first 15 picks or so, but there's really good value among centers all the way down through the first round and then through the middle of, middle of the second round. Uh, you know, you've got guys like Mason McTavish and Matty Benyers at the very top end of the draft. Uh, then you have uh, in a second tier there, you've got guys like Cole Sillinger and Ken Johnson. And just below them, you have Chaz Lucius, who's a tremendous goal scorer. Uh, and a guy like Zachary Bolduc out of the Quebec League. So you've got some really top-end guys uh, down through pick number 20, and even past, past pick number 20, you've still got probably another four or five centers who could go in that back third of the, of the first round. So I think we could see as many as you know, 10 or 11 centers go in the first round. We got two uh, former first-round picks going head-to-head -to -head in the Stanley Cup final with Price and Vasilevsky. Goalies, though, normally there's not a lot of representation in the first round of NHL drafts, particularly in recent years. In your rankings, you have Jasper Wallstead ranked 10th overall. Why is he so high on your list? Well, it, it's odd. You're exactly right about that. Uh, you know, the last decade, there really haven't been a whole lot of uh, goaltenders taken anywhere in the first round, much less in the top 10. Uh, I think that's because uh, they take so long to develop that you want to get a little bit more uh, immediate impact for your buck uh, in the first round. But, you know, two years ago, we had Spencer Knight way up high. Last year, we had Yaroslav Askarov, uh, I think, at 11th. And uh, Wallstead is right in that category in that he's a really big athletic kid who's got very strong techniques. I mean, he, what I love the most about him is he's very quiet in that he lets the play come to him. He's certainly capable of making the acrobatic save when called upon, but he doesn't really ever get scrambly in his net. He, late, he lets his size and his technique and his perfect positioning take over, and he lets a lot of pucks just hit him and very calmly moves the puck out to his defenseman, and they go from there. All right, you rank 318 eligible prospects. So, <laughs> so give us some of the names that have been rising up the draft board. Yeah, two guys in particular really stand out for me. Uh, Matt Coronado, who is a winger for the Chicago Steel in the USHL. Start of the year in last August when we did our preseason top 100, he wasn't even on the list. He was nowhere to be found. Uh, he went to the Chicago Steel this year and he scored 48 goals, which is more goals than anybody scored in junior hockey anywhere on the planet. Uh, he was the driver of their offense. They won the, uh, the USHL's 
uh, championship. They were the best team in the regular season. They were the best team in the playoffs. He was the play driver who was really the engine of that team. And when you're capable of scoring 48 goals in a year like this, uh, you got to get a, a hat tip from Redline Report. That's for sure. And the other one is a, a smallish Belarus defenseman named Dmitry Kuzmin, who really announced himself um, at the World Under-18 Championships down in Texas uh, in late April, early May. Um, I think, you know, he's a smaller kid who's only 5'10", 176 pounds, but very dynamic on the back end. Uh, I like to say about him that if his last name was Smith and he had played in the WHL all year or the USHL all, all year and people had gotten to see a lot of him, I think he for sure would be a first round draft pick. And again, uh, nobody even knew who he was at the start of the season. So this kid is a really dynamic puck moving and puck rushing defenseman who plays despite his small size with a lot of bite and jam to his game. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for the time, and congratulations on getting through a tough year to rate players because I know it hasn't been easy. But uh, all the best, and hopefully we'll be uh, talking to you before the draft on the 23rd. Great. Thank you, EJ. The Hughes family quickly becoming the first family in the NHL. We know about Quinn. We know about Jack. And now it's Luke's turn to shine. Um, how is his game different or the same as his brother's? Not as dynamic as Quinn, who went seventh overall, of course, the Vancouver Canucks. Um, obviously, he's a defenseman like Quinn, unlike Jack, who's a center. And he's incredibly dynamic offensively. But I will tell you this. If you had asked me four months ago about Luke Hughes, I would have said he would be the lowest drafted player after number seven. Certainly maybe even as low as 8, 9, 10, 11. But in talking to people recently, he absolutely is trending significantly. A lot of people have dug deeper into his background. If you talk to the family, if you talk to Jim, he'll tell you that he believes very strongly that there's a good chance Luke could be the best of all of them. And I don't think he's kidding when he says things like that. So um, to me, he's a fascinating guy. I definitely believe now, and I did not think this, that he will be selected in the top five in talking to different teams. Will perhaps, perhaps a team like the New Jersey Devils, who I would say four months ago were really challenged with one question, and that is, does Luke Hughes belong on the Devils because of his brother or because of his skill? And I feel like there's been a transition there for a lot of teams in that upper echelon of the draft that think now it's totally dependent or it's totally based off of his skill, the season he's had, and the maturity that he's shown. I think like a little sibling rivalry when it comes to the draft as to who's going to get drafted higher. And you definitely can't get higher than Jack. So uh, are we going to see Luke maybe in the middle between one and seven? And I think that's where he seems to be placed. I think you got it down right there lots. I mean, this young man, not only did he have to deal with COVID, but he had a lacerated tendon. So he missed part of the season. He missed the U18s, which is unfortunate because that's when he really would have got to, sh uh, to, to play against all of his peers. And he would have had a, the opportunity to shine and everybody would have seen him in that the final turn of the year for the draft but at 6'2 and uh, uh, over 180 pounds he'd be going to the University of Michigan and it's difficult for defensemen to step right in Quinn was a more dynamic you already said a lot some more dynamic defenseman he had that uh, the smaller size and this quick stick but one thing about Luke he when he has the puck he dictates the pace of play and he's done it at every age group that he's been at he's a fantastic skater just like his brothers and when you've got that size and that skill you know it might take a couple of years at the University of Michigan we may not see him for a few years uh, until he gets into the National Hockey League but that's exactly where he wants to develop that's where uh, a perfect situation for this young guy to, to find his game and really when he gets the National Hockey League he can make his own name and not worry about the older brothers because I'm sure this is going to be the biggest battle he's, he's had is the comparison battle uh, to his two older brothers. But uh, Luke Hughes, no question about it, is a legitimate top five pick. Well, Reader, I'm going to touch on a couple of points that you talked about there. And first of all, the development. I watched Luke play in under 16s and now he's progressed really nicely over the course of that time really raw at that point defense and you thought ah oh, he looks a little bit like Bambi on skates but he's got to figure it out now there's no question about that but when you look at where 
He's come from to where he's gone. It's spectacular. I think he's a better defender than his brother at this point. But you look at the common thread amongst the three brothers. They're highly, highly competitive. They would have had to be, especially the youngest one, that being Luke, in a family that's all about hockey and all about sports. And then you look at the skating ability. It's the edge work. It's the speed. It's the ability to play with that kind of agility. And then, of course, the confidence with the puck. That is shared amongst all three brothers. Not afraid, even if he's the last guy, to do some risky things at the line. He talked about controlled entries and exits. Obviously, he's got his head into the game, so it speaks to the hockey IQ. I love what Luke Hughes brings to the table, and I agree with you lots. The more I talk to people, the more he's trending upward. And I think after Owen Power, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Is it Brant Clark? Is it Edmondson? Or is it Luke Hughes as the next defenseman off the board? Joined by Luke Hughes right now on our Prospect Show. Luke, uh, congratulations on all your success to this point. Um, your brothers have gone through this process before. I want to talk about you. It's your time to shine. What has what the process been like for you uh, surrounding this year's draft? Yeah, I mean, obviously it was pretty weird with, um, you know, COVID. It was a different year, but, um, you know, I, me, and my, me and my teammates were really lucky to and fortunate to be practicing and playing, um, you know, this year. So, you know, it was awesome, and, um, you know, it was, a, it was a great year. Uh, we saw you there, uh, you know, high-fiving and hugging your brothers when they got selected uh, very high in those first rounds. So what, what was it like going through that and now knowing that your turn is coming up here in a couple of days? Yeah, I mean, like, at the time, you know, you're so proud of, you know, both your brothers. Um, obviously, you want to get there yourself. And, um, you know, I know all three of us have worked super hard to, you know, be where we are right now. So, um, you know, you know, I'm really excited for the for for the next month, and um, yeah, that, that's kind of all I can say right now. All right, you're a defenseman like uh, your older brother Quinn. Uh, what is your game like, though? Describe your game as if some scouts are talking to you right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can, um, you know, I'm someone who can play in all situations. Um, you know, I can play on the power play, play the PK. Um, you know, I can defend the cycle, defend the rush, defend that front. Um, you know, I'm pretty poised with the puck. Um, you know, I, I can. I think a big part of my game is exits and entries, exits uh, out of my zone and entries in the offensive zone. And, um, you know, I, I pride myself on good passing and, you know, trying to get things done in the offensive zone too. So anything you're working on this summer between now and the time you're drafted? Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to work on everything, um, you know, get bigger, faster, stronger, um, just so I could dominate the next couple levels and, you know, just try to, I mean, there's always, you know, areas you can improve on um, in everything you do, so. Have you thought about what it's going to be like someday when you get to face your brothers in the National Hockey League? Has, has that crossed your mind? Um, I mean, it's always a dream to either play with your brothers or, or play against them in the, in the National League. So, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's crossed my mind, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, focused on what, like, my, my preparation right now towards the draft and towards World Junior Camp, so, um you know, I'm, I'm not really worried about that stuff right now. I'm just, you know, trying to get better every day. And, um, you know, if that happens, that happens. And, you know, that would be super, super fun. So, And then coming up, committed to University of Michigan next year with an absolutely loaded roster for the Wolverines. Uh, your older brother, Quinn, went the collegiate route. Uh, what, what did he tell you about his college experience that maybe you can, you know, uh, learn from? Yeah, I think, you know, watching Quinn just grow, not even on the ice, but as a person too, um, you know, throughout, through those two years at college, um, you know, he really enjoyed his time in Michigan. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of the reason why I'm going there too. So, um, you know, watching him develop those two years and, um, you know, how much fun and how much better he got there, um, you know, it was awesome to see. And, you know, I'm really excited to step on campus and, you know, we got a really good team. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully we win. So. That's always the goal. Fun team to watch, yeah. certainly. Coming up next year at Michigan. Luke, thanks so much for the time. Uh, enjoy this whole experience, and we look forward to hearing your name called uh, early coming up in this year's entry draft. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Let's talk about who we believe may go two and three. Starting at number three, it is Brant Clark out of the OHL and the Barry Colts. Although he did spend his season in Slovakia with the OHL shut down for the year, among league defensemen under 22 years of age, Clark finished second in points with 15. You can see the note at the bottom there, fourth among demon in points with seven at the 2021 U18 World Championships as well. Sam, why do you think Brant Clark would be a good pick at number three? 
because I think there was a lot of growing up that happened this year. He and his brother Graham packed their bags. They went over to Slovakia to play. And really, it was the great unknown. I mean, the new town, new ice uh, rink in terms of surface and size. And you got new te teammates. You don't know the language. You don't know the food. And that was a real eye-opener for these guys. Well, after about a month, Graham Clark got signed by the Devils. He went home and allowed Grant just to stay there basically all alone. And you know what? It was a little slow for him to get moving. But after a really good year in Barry, he finally found that confidence in Slovakia. I talked to one of his teammates, Slater Doggett, and said by the end of it, he was running our power play, and he was likely our best defenseman. Now, let's look at his under-18s. Here's a guy who walks in early on in the tournament, really performs well, puts up points, then realizes, hey, we need a little bit more defense. So he takes a step back from that offensive role. He gets taken off that number one power play, which was a bit of a red flag to some scouts, and then settles into his game and is moving pucks really good, really safe with it. And then you look at uh, the points that he was able to put up there. Yeah, no problem there. Fourth in the tournament for, as far as D scoring is go, uh, goes. But the one thing that they are concerned a little bit about him He's a little bit knock-kneed. Is the skating going to be up to par at the NHL level? One thing is for sure, this guy is extremely confident with the puck. You go back to his days playing under 16 with the likes of Shane Wright, he put up a boatload of points. He did it again in Barry as a 16-year-old defenseman, has no problem initiating the rush, has no problem trying to hit that home run play, maybe a little bit too often sometimes, but a right shot D at 6'2", 185 pounds is tough to find, especially with the poise and patience that Brant Clark plays with. All right, Brant Clark, we think, going at number three. At number two, it's another one of those Michigan Wolverines. Matt Beneers out of Hingham, Massachusetts, and this kid had a huge impact for Team USA at the World Junior Championships this past year. You can see uh, what he's done and his career bio here, just some of the points. Actually planned to attend Harvard, but with the Ivy League season canceled, he went to University of Michigan. Uh, decided to take pre-med classes at Michigan. And lots, I love this note about him. We, we know his hockey game is good, but he loves the show Dr. Pimple Popper, and he wants to be a dermatologist when all is said and done. Zits are ugly. This guy's game on the ice is beautiful. Why do you like Matty Beneers potentially at number two? Well, he could keep going. As he's a really interesting story. His mom, of course, went to Cordell. She was an actress on Broadway. She's an attorney. I love when you have these really high-achieving families. I do feel it often rubs off on their children, and Matty Benear certainly fits that bill. Even the aggressive move when Harvard wasn't going, announced it wasn't going to play this year, to go and play for Michigan, a place that he fit in beautifully. But Michigan certainly, in speaking with them, they felt like he really fell in their lap last moment, and boy, were they ever better off for it. Now, in my opinion, this draft will start at number two. Now, you, Sam and I may argue about that later when we get to Owen Power, but I do believe this is where the draft could really take a crazy turn. And Ron Francis, the Seattle Kraken, who moved up in the lottery, have a chance to dictate a lot of things in this draft. They've got to decide whether or not they want a guy like Matt Beneers, who is one of the safest picks to play and play for a long time in the National Hockey League, or maybe go for one of these really what I think are going to be elite defensemen, even after Owen Power. That's going to be a tough decision for the Kraken, and I can't wait to see which direction they go. But if they do go with Beneers, Ronnie Francis will somewhat be getting a guy that could potentially resemble very much like him in excellent. Now, Ronnie, I was considered a number one center, but he ended up being a number two, obviously, with Mario Lemieux. Matt Beneers, to me, is a prototypical number two 200-foot game centerman for any club in the National Hockey League, the type of player that you can win a championship with. He is that good on both ends of the ice. There is nothing that he has any weakness in. Teams are going to have to decide, though, is he going to be like a Jonathan Taves-type leader? Could he be that guy? Or maybe he would be maybe a little bit more like a Joel Erickson act, a guy that's maybe not as offensively gifted. Taves has shown us both throughout his career, for me, at the end of the day, I love Matty Beneers. I think long and hard about it as well, though. Well, lots. Matty Beneers played in the World Championship. That's the men's World Championship as well. At the end of his uh, university season, 
uh, he was put on the team and he fit in extremely well and he fit in because of his skating his skating style and his ability to stay with the play and his ability to think the game he didn't put up a lot of points he ended up getting injured late in the tournament the team did win a bronze medal and a lot of people including me thought that they were right up there for the gold medal they lost the semifinal to Canada otherwise they probably would have taken home a gold medal so Beniers look good against men which is a great sign when you've got your draft coming up you're playing in the men's world championship and teams are like all right how's it going to go one thing to play college nothing to play uh, uh, against 30 year olds at a high level competition and uh, I thought he was very very good in the tournament it took him a little while to get going but unfortunately the, the injury late derailed him but I, I agree I think this guy is going to have a long long career in the National Hockey League because he understands the game and he knows he knows where the game's going. He's a thinker of the game and that goes a long way when he's got that skill set. Owen Power, another guy who also had a big impact at the World Championships, playing with men for Team Canada. Uh, by all accounts, he will be the consensus number one overall pick coming up in a couple of weeks. Another University of Michigan kid. You can see he's a big defenseman, six foot six, uh, patrols that back end, smooth skater. Uh, comparisons to Victor Hedman, lots. Uh, that's a guy you know well. You selected him down in Tampa. Owen Power, what do you make of him going number one, Brian? Yeah, you know, a little bit of a modern-day Chris Pronger. Probably not as nasty, but skills similar to Victor Hedden. He's not quite where he was. We obviously watched him intensely that draft year. Owen Power does remind me. You can see the potential and the possibilities. I can't see how the Buffalo Sabres could pass on him. I know that Owen Power has talked about potentially returning back. For another year at Michigan, I wouldn't worry about that. First off, for a defenseman, almost all of them could use another year somewhere. Even Victor Hedman, who did come in and play 20-plus minutes his first year, there still were some things that he needed to learn. But the difference there is that he did play a full season, a couple of seasons, actually, in the Swedish Elite League, and he had a dominant veteran partner in Matthias Commander who really showed him and taught him the ropes. Owen Power hasn't had that long tutelage at that type of a level. He was great for Canada, don't get me wrong. I mean, he opened my eyes big time. I think he's going to be a dynamic player. I think he's a franchise player. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, he probably will turn pro, but you never know. I think you will, too, lots. I mean, you're the number one pick. And the reason we look at him and think he's like a Victor Hedman is the way, uh, the, the way he plays. He's not an overly physical player. He doesn't initiate contact. He doesn't shy away from it. And in the Worlds, we saw when he was pushed and he wanted to push back, well, he would dominate because of his size. It's 6'6", six, six, pushing almost 220 pounds, and he's going to get bigger. He's going to fill out. But his skating stride and his ability to make the first pass and his vision in the offensive zone and his confidence with the puck in the neutral zone he was playing in overtime in the gold medal game uh, and you watched him play and you're like wow this guy is 18 this guy is going to be drafted and this guy is one of the best players in the men's world championship tournament for the gold medal team he was very impressive and as soon as I watched him play a few games that tournament that's the first thing I thought was Victor Hedman yeah no question and when you look at how it started for him he had three seconds worth of ice time in that first period, a 2 nothing loss to Latvia, and Canada's coaches said, this isn't going to go so well. So they played him a little bit more in the second period, a bit more in the third period. He ended up playing about eight minutes in that game, and they thought, well, we have something here. But it didn't really happen for him at the Worlds until Colin Miller got hurt. And when that happened, that opened up the door and allowed him some more ice time. He was then paired with Troy Stetcher, and they were really the number two pairing for um, Gerard Gallant and Andre Tournier in that tournament. And Lots, you talked a little bit about that tutelage that Hedman had. Well, some of that tutelage came in the form of Troy Stetcher playing with power at the Worlds. And I talked to Troy Stetcher about it. He said, he doesn't really stand out in any one particular area of the game. He's just good in all of them. And if I look at the way he's played in this tournament and having played beside him, I believe he can step in and play meaningful minutes in the National Hockey League right away. And no doubt it was that Worlds that put him over the hump, as you said, Reader. Interesting. Sam said if he's a GM, he wouldn't be around to see Volstead come to fruition. You've been a GM. Would you take a goalie in the first round, and would you take a goalie in the top ten picks? There's no doubt that it's risky business and look no farther than the last two years. Obviously, the Predators checked in 
in 2020 and took Yaroslav Askarov, 11th overall. Now, last year was not a great season from him as opposed to the year before. But go back another draft to 2019, and there was a guy by the name of Spencer Knight. These are not top 10 picks, but he was 13th overall. And look what he accomplished this year. You can be a hero or a goat real quickly, especially when you talk to GMs, and they always name the same players. A couple of guys that may retire this year, one of them for sure, not sure in the other one. I'm talking about a guy like Ryan Miller, fifth round pick, 138th overall. As Sam mentioned, it just takes a long time for a lot of these guys to matriculate. The last couple of years, a GM could easily convince himself, well, look at Spencer Knight, or he could say, look at Askarov. Maybe that was too soon. Maybe I'll never see him. Maybe I won't be the GM when he comes to play, even if he is good. And that does scare a lot of people. And then, of course, the other guy was referencing Pekka Rene. Everybody knows how far back in the draft he was picked. He was The draft was just about shut down by the time the Nashville Predators selected him. He didn't even play his draft year, for that matter. If you really look back to it, you had to watch this guy practice to get a read on him. So risky business. This year, as Sam said, though, I do agree with him. You get a hall pass. Swing away, fellas. It's time for a 2021 NHL Draft Prospect Profile as we take a look at three potential top ten picks from the University of Michigan. Let's start with the consensus top pick in the draft with defenseman Owen Power. At 6'6 and 213 pounds, his combination of size and skill have scouts projecting him as a clear-cut top pair defenseman. Even in a shortened 26-game season, Power impressed with 16 points while playing in all situations. Michigan hockey head coach Mel Pearson said that Power has the complete package, adding that there is really no weakness in his game. It's highly unlikely Power will fall to the wings at six, so let's take a look at another one of the Wolverines. Center Matthew Beneers was a point-per-game player in his time in Ann Arbor while solidifying himself as a solid two-way player. Director of NHL Central Scouting Dan Marr wrote that Beneers has that rare breed of smart skills and sandpaper that all NHL clubs covet, particularly in the Stanley Cup playoffs, a hard-working and ultimate competitor. Beneers also held his own on the international stage, winning gold with Team USA, World Junior Championships in December, and a bronze in the World Championships in May. Many mock drafts have Beneers going second overall, but NHL Central Scouting has another Wolverine forward ranked slightly higher. When we asked NHL.com's draft writer Mike Morial about Kent Johnson, the first words out of his mouth were offensive sniper. Johnson had 27 points in 26 games, including nine goals this season, which was the most points for any draft-eligible freshman in the NCAA. Listed on the draft boards as a center, Johnson also played wing for the Wolverines this season. His strengths are his offensive skill and creativity, with Michigan hockey head coach Mel Pearson saying he's worth the price of admission. If you want to be entertained, Kent Johnson is going to entertain you. It's time for 2021 NHL Draft Prospect Profile. Today we're focusing on the top two netminders in the draft, Jesper Wallstadt and Sebastian Kosa. Let's start with the six foot three goaltender out of Sweden, Jesper Wallstad. The 18 year old can read the game well, has good quickness, and plays a hybrid butterfly athletic style similar to a goaltender Red Wing fans are familiar with, Jonathan Bernier. Director of NHL European Scouting Goran Stubbs said, Wallstad is the best Sweden born goaltending prospect he's seen in the last five years. Wallstad is the number one ranked European goalie on NHL Central Scouting prospect rankings and several mock drafts have predicted the Red Wings taking the Swedish netminder, including the mock draft of TSN's director of scouting, Craig Button. If Wallstead is selected by the Red Wings with the sixth pick, he'd be the highest draft pick of any Swedish-born goaltender. Also in the conversation is NHL Central Scouting's top-ranked North American goaltender, Sebastian Kosa. Standing six foot six and weighing in at 210 pounds, Kosa went 17-1-1, a 1.57 goals against average and a 9.41 save percentage with four shutouts in 19 games played with the Edmonton Oil Kings of the WHL. Kosa, known for his competitiveness and mobility for his lengthy size, shot up the draft boards with his strong season in Edmonton. 
When asked about COSA, NHL.com staff writer Mike Morial said on the word on Woodward that he's going to be a number one goalie in this league. It's just a matter of how soon it happens. The Athletics' Corey Pronman asked an anonymous NHL scout about the goalie tandem. He believes both Wallstadt and COSA will be drafted in the top 15. 